When you close your eyes and try to imagine war, what do you see? What do you hear? Do you see the fire that rains down from the skies? Or the gunshots that ring through the night? Perhaps you even see blood. Blood on a child's face. Or perhaps the, the screams from the thousands of people all around you. I've always wondered what war is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Alright, so I've always wondered what war is. And more importantly, when do wars end? So when the International Committee of the Red Cross called me last year, I was ironically still serving my second year in national service. Uh, it's, only sli it's, slightly it's slightly ironic because the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, unlike the, the National Red Cross Societies, deals solely with armed conflict. They have a mandate under international humanitarian law to protect the lives and dignity of all parties involved in a conflict. National Red Cross Societies handles the other aspects of uh, the humanitarian effort, such as blood donation drives and disaster management. So when the International Committee of the Red Cross called me and asked me what, kind, what country I would like to report from, I said, Georgia. Georgia is an exceedingly beautiful country. Exceedingly beautiful because they have snow-capped mountains and pristine beaches. And I would say that they are probably even more beautiful than Singapore. Like Singapore, it is a very small country surrounded by larger neighbours. And, uh, and like Singapore, they sit on the crossroads of two great civilizations. For them, it's Europe and Asia. They're surrounded by larger neighbors, in the sense that they are surrounded by Russia, Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. The greatest difference between Singapore and Georgia is that Singapore had experienced two wars in recent history. The first, in 1992, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and most recently, in 2008. The two areas of, of contention are colored on the map. The purple color is South Ossetia, and the green color is Abkhazia. Georgia believes that these two regions belong to them, but, Rus but Russia believes that these two regions are independent states that needed to be defended from jo uh, Georgia. But well, we're not here today to discuss who is right and who is wrong. I am less interested in the affairs of politicians than the effects of war. Right now, as, as I speak, diplomatic and military tensions still exist, especially along the administrative borderlines that divide these two regions from the rest of Georgia. What this war did was to divide people. Neighbors became strangers. Neighbors barely living 100 meters apart can no longer communicate with each other or to visit each other. This man is from Abkhazia and behind him is Abkhazia. He has to cross the border illegally every day to get daily supplies like soap, water, food and to meet friends, friends that he has made <coughs> before the war. Johnny was also trying to cross the river illegally in 1993 when he stepped on a mine that blew up both of his legs. Johnny is what humanitarian organizations call an internally displaced person, an IDP. IDPs, IDPs are people who are forced to flee their homes due to a conflict. There are currently more than 258,000 IDPs in Georgia, and they stay in collective centers that are typically abandoned buildings, such as this Soviet era paper factory, and this former hospital morgue. The worst thing about this place is not the fact that it used to be a place that used to, be, that, that used to store dead bodies. The worst thing about this place is not the broken floorboards or the peeling paint 
or the stale stench of smell of sweat. <laughs> the worst thing about this place is that these people cannot call this home. They cannot call this home. And the government might at any time evict them or move them. And because they cannot call this place home, they are unwilling to find long-term employment, to rebuild their lives, to repair their families. Becca, this is Becca. He stands at a spot where he was hit by bomb shrapnel in 2008, blowing part of his skull away. When he awoke from a coma, he drew this picture. The boy in the picture is him, and behind him, he drew a tank firing a missile. Red eyes say psychologist meant that he was terrified, whereas the yellow blistering sun signified his optimism. But when he found out that a friend whom he was playing with on the day the bomb struck had died, he drew the exact same picture, except that a missile flew directly from the tank to his heart, to the, friend of, to the heart of his friend, and where he drew the yellow blistering sun for his own picture, he left an echoing void. With enough willpower, physical losses can be overcome. This is Janadi who started a chicken farm with a micro grant from the ICRC. Most curiously, the ICRC have found that micro loans do not work in this context. Because even if you give them, even if you lend them a small sum of money, they may not, they may not, they're not confident of restarting their lives because you know, if they were to lose everything a second time or a third time because of war, they will not only be losing everything a second or third time, they will be losing money that's not theirs, even if the money is a small amount. So the ICRC reviews business proposals from these villagers and then give them a small sum of money that they can set up their businesses and that, and that they can have the, a small dose of confidence to rebuild their businesses, lives, and families. This is another success story, Nariman and his, uh, and his rabbit farm. So now that we know that with enough willpower, and perhaps a small sum of money, physical losses can be overcome. But what about emotional losses? This, this boy holds onto two rosaries that his father made in prison. His father was captured shortly after the family was forced to flee their home in where is now considered part of South Ossetia. Bilia's husband was forcibly taken in front of their families, in front of their eyes, in the middle of the night at their former home in Abkhazia. Till today, Bilia does not know if her husband is dead or alive. Her son, now being forced to be the man of the family, now works as a traditional dancer to support the family. And he wants to be a traditional dance choreographer when he grows up in future. To us in Singapore, it might be peculiar that one may actually consider, contemplate a career in dance to support his family. But in Georgia, a society that prides itself on its culture and heritage, it is not surprising at all. Then, I met Nino. To many people, to many organizations, Nino's husband is a political fighter. Nino's husband is a rebel. But to Nino, her husband is only a man trying to defend his home. He was captured in 1993. He went missing in 1993. And not knowing whether he is still dead or alive, Nino cannot move on. In Georgian Orthodox churches, there are two sides where people pray before they enter the church. On the left hand side is Theotokos, the mother of God. And on the right hand side is Jesus Christ, the judge of the living and the dead. These people with missing family members face a dilemma. Which side should, she go, should they go to to pray for the missing family member? You know, like many other people with missing family members, first walk to the left hand side where Teotokos is to pray for the health of the missing family member before walking to the right to pray for his departed soul. This is Katia. Katia was only two years old when her father 
was missing. We might think she was only two years old when her father went missing, and this happened nearly 20 years ago. How badly could she have been affected? After all, don't time heal all wounds? This is a short excerpt of a video interview I had with her. It was only after I spoke to her that I realized that these people do not want to move on. For by moving on, they feel that they love the missing family member less. So they remind themselves of this sorrow every day of their lives, and they pass on this mark of filial piety from parent to child. Generation to generation, it is a mark of filial piety and a burden of sorrow. This sorrow has been passed on from Nino to Katia, and it will no doubt be passed on from Katia to her son. Generation to generation, this is an inheritance of sadness. When we think about war, when we think about war, we often think about the drama, about the tragedy, about the blood, about the violence. And it is only normal for us to think this way because we see this in the newspapers, we see this in the movies, we see this on TV. And so, when the drama ends, when the violence and gore ends, we think that the war has ended. But if, if we think of war, and we think it not only of the blood and the bombs, and the guns and the screams, but also of people like Nino and their immense psychological burden, we realize that for these people, war never really ends. Thank you.